Like I said earlier, we're going to finish chapters 27 and 28 of Genesis today. The sermon title is When Worldviews Collide. You've probably heard the word worldview before, but maybe you've wondered what it means or why some people think that it's so important. The Cultural Research Center at Arizona Christian University likens a person's worldview to a computer's operating system when trying to describe how important it is. So they said, whenever we are about to make a decision, we unconsciously run it through a mental, spiritual, and emotional filter that allows us to make choices consistent with what we believe to be true, significant, and appropriate. Without a worldview, we'd be incapable of arriving at many of the hundreds of decisions we make each day because each option would seem just as appealing as every other. So for example, if you viewed the world as a random place that was not created and designed by a loving and sovereign God with a plan for it, then it makes sense that you would maybe buy into the thinking that there's no planet B and we have to do whatever we have to by all means necessary to make sure that this world lasts forever, otherwise the human race could die off. It's a different worldview, right, than the biblical or if you view all people as being basically good, well, then you might, fall, you might buy into the follow your heart mantra or the if it's natural, it's good heresy. Or if you, your worldview is that truth is relative, then you're going to struggle constantly to figure out what you believe is right and wrong. And your beliefs about right and wrong will evolve and change throughout your life. And you will have to find ways to cope with contradictory beliefs in your mind. And this affects the church as well, because it's not like all people who identify themselves as Christians have the same worldview. You can believe in God, but let's say that you believe that God changes. That He's not the same God, right? That He's changing, and He's learning, and He's adapting. Well, then you're going to struggle to mix moral relativity with biblical morality and figure out how those worlds collide. Or, let's say that you believe in God being the creator, but also in evolution. We've taught about that stuff before when we started Genesis, right? Well, then that's going to cause some interpretive problems when you read the Bible. And so that's going to collide with your interpretation of many places of Scripture, and it's probably going to lead you to have a method of interpretation that will bring up problems in other places. Or let's say that you believe in Jesus, but that He is not God, right? You believe that He's the Son of God, but not God the Son. Well, then you're going to struggle to make sense of the atoning sacrifice that He made on the cross if He's not divine, if He's just a man. And so worldview matters. And today's sermon is not all about worldview, but I believe that we do see how Jacob and Esau's worldviews led them in different directions in life. And it was a big deal. And so before we, we dig in, uh, let's pray and ask God to help us. God, we pray that you would help us to be humbly just bend down on our knees today and come before you willing to receive truths from your word. And I pray that they would be well communicated. I pray that they would be correctly understood and that we would leave here really with a more biblical worldview, but also being willing to gain a more biblical worldview if we find out that maybe we don't have what we thought we had. And that's okay. Thankfully, you don't make it hard to change that. Uh, but I pray, God, that, um, that we would just be willing and humble and thirsty for you today. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So if you are opening, uh, we'll have the scriptures up on the screens, but if you're following along on your Bibles, then we're going to start in Genesis chapter 27, verse 41 which says, Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. 
And Esau determined in his heart, the days of mourning for my father are approaching. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. See, Esau, as we've been studying, he hadn't really been getting what he wanted. Right? And his response to that was to continue hardening his heart. Rather than humbly submitting himself to the plans of God, he let his anger move from simmer to rolling boil. And, and we talked about last week how there's some people who won't come to their senses until they come to the end of their rope. Well, there's also some people who just won't come to their senses. And up to this point, Esau was really looking like one of those people, at least. And it's an amazing thing to see people hit rock bottom and then soften their hearts to God. But it is an awful thing to see people hit rock bottom and get out a hammer and chisel instead. That is tragic. And that appears to be what Esau is doing. And that kind of attitude will actually be most evident in the world during the times of tribulation. Revelation 16, 8 through 11 says, And the fourth angel poured out his bowl upon the sun, and it was given power to scorch people with fire. And the people were scorched with fierce heat, and they blasphemed the name of God, who has the power over these plagues. And they did not repent so as to give him glory. And the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became darkened, and they gnawed their tongues because of pain. And they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pain and their sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. You see, it's easy to submit yourself to the plans of God when you like the plans. Right? Like, it's like dealing with the government. It's easy to submit ourselves to the government's plans and policies when we like them. And they benefit us. It's a harder pill to swallow, though, when you're not happy. And thankfully, God is not sinful, like the people who do make up all world governments. But that doesn't discount the fact that His plans are not always what we want, right? They don't always fit our desires. And the question is, how are we going to respond when we don't like God's plans? And so I want to begin this morning by offering two answers to that question. First, when you don't like God's plans, trust Him anyway. What good is it going to do you to fight Him about it? It's not going to help. Those people during the end times when they're suffering more than they've ever suffered before, their response is not to repent. They don't see God. They only see a God who they want to punch in the face. Their perspective is off. They're not seeing anything correctly. They don't see God correctly. They don't see themselves correctly, their predicament correctly, or any of the situations around them correctly. And Esau didn't either. He didn't. He had a horrible perspective. He couldn't get the right perspective, but we don't have to be that way. There will come times when we don't understand what God is doing or why he's doing it or how it is going to work out, as Scripture says, for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. But we can trust him anyway. By standing on the truths that we learn from God's word about his character and his power and his ultimate plan, no matter what it looks like to us, we know that it's going to work out in the end for his glory and our good. We don't have to be like the fans sitting at home watching sports, yelling at the coach one minute, what are you thinking? He's going to cost us the game. This is never going to work. This guy needs to be fired. But then at the end of the game, be like, genius. Coach of the year right there. Now, instead, we can look at the people who are saying, what are you thinking? And say, it's okay. Trust the process. It's going to be all right. No, he's going to cost us the game. No, no. No, he's going to win. Now, this is never going to work. Relax. It's going to work. No, 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 this guy needs to be fired. Whoa, no. No, he needs to be worshipped. You're going to see it one day. And if God's plans don't match your plans, change your plans. <laughs> 
Change your plans. It's not going to do you any good to keep trying to shove your plans through. Psalm 37, 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Okay, that's truth. We know that the Bible also teaches adamantly and abundantly that prayer is important, that it's powerful, that God desires to give good gifts to his children. However, sometimes what we want and or ask for doesn't match with God's good plans. Right? He's coming in for a high five and we're coming in with a fist bump. And it just doesn't work. And when that happens, it's us who needs to move, not God. We don't need to change his plans. We need to change our desires. That's part of the sanctification process. As we grow and mature in Christ, what you're going to find, which we would call delighting ourselves in the, war, in the Lord, that the desires of our heart are going to more and more start to match the desires of God's heart. And so our plans are going to more and more be in step with his plans. Now, that's not a foolproof process because on this side of heaven, we are never going to reach perfection, nor are we ever going to be all-knowing the way that God is. So there's still going to be times when they don't match. And we just have to humble ourselves and submit to God's plans and trust him. That there may come a day when you find yourself wanting to shake your fist and curse God, but I implore you, if that day ever comes for you, fall on your face instead and pray and humble yourself. We're going to continue in verses 42 through 46. When the words of her older son Esau were reported to Rebekah, she summoned her younger son Jacob and said to him, Listen. Your brother Esau is consoling himself by planning to kill you. So now, my son, listen to me. Flee at once to my brother Laban in Haran and stay with him for a few days until your brother's anger subsides, until your brother's rage turns away from you and he forgets what you've done to him. Then I will send for you and bring you back from there. Why should I lose both of you in one day? So Rebekah said to Isaac, I'm sick of my life because of these Hittite girls. If Jacob marries someone from around here... Like these Hittite girls. What good is my life? Oh, Rebecca. Another round of snooping, scheming, and manipulation. Right? This sermon could have easily been, enti- been titled Dysfunctional Family Drama Part 2. A follow-up from last week's. But then if you keep reading these stories, you're going to be like, Hey, well, we need to have part 3, 4, 5. It just goes on and on and on. There's a lot of dysfunctional family drama Still to come. But there's also, there's just no faith. Right? Rebecca still doesn't have faith. She doesn't have faith that God can protect Jacob. And let's, hey, it's fine. You're a mother. You want to protect your son. That's fine. But you don't have to resort to lying and manipulation to do it. And notice that Rebecca, and and what she's doing, it's not going to serve her well. It hurts her. She thought that Jacob just needed to leave for a little while, and Esau's anger would subside. Well, Jacob's departure turned out to be 20 years. And when he returns, there is no record of him ever seeing his mother again. And what she tells Isaac, yes, it's probably still true, what she's telling Isaac. But her deeper motives are being concealed, right? And I've taught before, you can be deceptive without outright lying. But deception is against the character of God, and it's not necessary. And you have to wonder how much differently things could have been with faith instead. Of course, we talked about how it would have been if Isaac had had faith to begin with. But then with Rebecca, if she'd been like, oh, well... Isaac's planning to bless Esau instead of Jacob. But God promised that Jacob was going to have the blessing. Huh, I wonder how he's going to work this out. Or even now, oh, Esau wants to kill Jacob. But God said Esau would serve Jacob. Hmm. It's going to be interesting to see how God does this. No, instead, no, no, I have to take care of it. I, I don't know. We, we can only hypothesize about what it would have been like the other way, but I guarantee you it would have been easier for this family. 
Let's continue. Now we're going into chapter 28. So Isaac summoned Jacob, blessed him, and commanded him, Do not marry a Canaanite girl. Go at once to Padan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father. Marry one of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you so that you become an assembly of peoples. May God give you and your offspring the blessing of Abraham so that you may possess the land where you live as a foreigner, the land God gave to Abraham. So Isaac sent Jacob to Padan Aram, to Laban, son of Bethuel, the Aramean, the brother of Rebekah, the mother of Jacob and Esau. So Isaac falls for it. Uh, and, but the good thing here about Isaac is when he did come to his senses, he stayed in his senses. That's good because he is connecting Jacob in his rightful place. He's putting him in the right place. He's connecting him with the, the blessing and the covenant of Abraham that was intended for him. So Esau noticed that Isaac blessed Jacob and sent him to Padan Aram to get a wife there. When he blessed him, Isaac commanded Jacob, do not marry a Canaanite girl. And Jacob listened to his father and mother and went to Padan Aram. Esau realized that his father Isaac disapproved of the Canaanite women. So Esau went to Ishmael and married, in addition to his other wives, Mahalath, daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son. She was the sister of of Nebaioth. So this is another insight into Esau's mind. He really just did not get it. Right? Somehow, Isaac and Rebekah's disappointment and displeasure in Esau's marriages had eluded Esau. And I'm not really sure how that happened. Maybe Isaac and Rebekah were really good at hiding it, or Esau was really bad at reading social cues. I mean, maybe you've met those people that just, they just don't catch the looks, the sighs, the snarkiness, the backhanded comments. Hopefully we're not the ones giving them. Nonetheless, he finally figured it out and he thought, well, maybe, you know what? I've found the solution to my problems. I'm going to go marry a daughter of Ishmael. I mean, what? He did not understand what was going on. He, he never understood what was going on. He didn't see things in terms of righteousness and faith and the plans and decrees of God. Instead, he saw the world as this weird like social dance that required earning favor and love instead of unconditional love and humble submission and service. And let's not forget that Isaac and Rebekah's favoritism with their kids and the subsequent lying and manipulation did not help Esau. He was a product of nature and nurture, but it was his worldview that did him in. And that happens with a lot of people, because if your worldview is off, your life is off. George Barna has long been a staple in surveys and statistics about biblical worldview. And he founded the Barna Group, which he's not a part of anymore. Instead, now he leads the Cultural Research Center at Arizona Christian University. And as reported by Christian Post, Barna said, Your worldview is the filter that you use to see and understand and experience and respond to the world around you. Because your worldview enables you to make sense of the world... You need a worldview just to get through every day. In fact, every single decision that you make, and you make hundreds of them, if not thousands of decisions every single day, every one of those flows through your worldview. The choices that you make are a result of what you believe as described by your worldview. So you've heard me talk about worldview before. Maybe you've wondered, well, what does he mean by a biblical worldview? Well, I'm going to read some statements that they use in some of their surveys to determine whether someone has a biblical worldview or not. All right? And I didn't come into this like, hey, I, I want to find a way to fit this into the sermon. I, in studying this passage, it was evident to me that Esau's worldview was a big problem in his life. And it affected his life, and it affects us as well. And so I'm going to read some of these statements. And this uh, is actually the surveyed people in this particular survey were uh, parents of preteens. And I'm going to read the statement, and I'm also going to uh, have a percentage. 
And so basically they either agree or disagree with the statement, right? And I'm going to read the percentage that disagree or that agree. And the percentage that I'm giving is specifically the percentage of people who identify as born again believers. Okay? And so we're going to start high, and then every one goes lower and lower from there. So like the, the first one, God is the all-powerful, all-knowing, perfect, and just creator of the universe who rules that universe today. Okay, so the percentage, born-again believers, parents of preteens, that agreed with that statement was 75%. Which is pretty high, but still you've got 25% that don't agree with that. But it just gets worse from here. All right. Uh, let's see. Universal purpose of life for all people across all cultures, so, socioeconomic status, and faiths is to know, love, and serve God with all your heart, mind, strength, and soul. 59% agreed. To understand the human condition, you must realize people are born into sin and can only be saved from the consequences of our sin by Jesus Christ. 50%. When he lived on earth, Jesus Christ was fully divine and also fully human, but he did not commit sins like other people. 47. A successful life is best defined as consistent obedience to God. 38%. Agreed. That's born-again believers. Now, only 10% of non-born-again agreed with that. But 38%. Human life is sacred, which we'll be dealing with next weekend. Only 35%. The Holy Spirit is a living entity, not just a symbol of God's power, presence, or purity. 34%. Determining moral truth is not up to each individual. There are moral absolutes that apply to everyone all the time. 30%. There's no such thing as karma. 27% is all that agreed with that statement. The last one, personal accumulation of money and other forms of wealth are entrusted to you by God to manage for his purposes. 26%. Legionnaire Ministries also conducted a survey where people responded to uh, the statements they created. And I'm not going to share those statements. In, well, I will... Share some more about that before we leave today. But Ken Ham was commenting on some of the numbers that they were finding. And I want to share some things that he said. 60% say the Holy Spirit is a force, but is not a personal being. But earlier in the survey, 97% agree that there's one true God in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Clearly, people are very confused about doctrine and theology and don't really know what they believe. He also commented, 99% of the evangelical survey respondents said the Bible is the highest authority for what I believe. But based on their answers, they either don't really believe that or know what that means, or they have no clue what the Bible actually teaches. And get this, this is from the stuff that I was reading, only 2% of U.S. parents altogether only 2% of U.S. parents of preteens have a biblical worldview. You cannot give what you do not have. This is a big deal. And I want us to understand what a biblical worldview is and that it is rapidly declining. When we talk about a biblical worldview, I'm not talking about secondary issues that Christians can agree to disagree on. We're talking about the very foundations of of our faith and practice that have everything to do with what we think and feel and how we live and worship. And while 70% of U.S. adults might label themselves as Christians in some form, only 6%, according to their research, have a biblical worldview. Instead, what they're finding is that most Americans blend their beliefs to create their own customized worldview. That is called syncretism. And it is everywhere, and it is dangerous. This stuff matters to our life. 
Neither Jacob nor Esau were perfect. And up to this point, we don't really have any reason to admire either of them. But what Jacob had going for him over Esau was his worldview. He saw the big picture much better. He valued the birthright and the blessing because he treasured the promises of God. Now, he went about trying to secure those promises in the wrong way. And it would cost him too. He's about, to, he's about to leave his family for 20 years and he's going to get into quite the mess when it comes time for him to get married, which we're not going to be in today. But we will continue in verses 10 through 17. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. He reached a certain place and spent the night there because the sun had set. He took one of the stones from the place, put it there at his head, and lay down in that place. And he dreamed. A stairway was set on the ground with its top reaching the sky, and God's angels were going up and down on it. The Lord was standing there beside him, saying, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your offspring the land on which you are lying. Your offspring will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out toward the west, the east, the north, and the south. All the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you and your offspring." Look, I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. He was afraid and said, What an awesome place this is. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. If you've ever heard the term Jacob's Ladder, this is where that comes from. Now, the translation that we just read used the word staircase instead of ladder, but other translations use ladder, and they're split on that. It doesn't really matter. That's not the point of the story. The point is that Jacob camped at this random place and had a dream where he saw the traffic between heaven and earth. And, well, he saw the highway to heaven, right, so to speak. And that's what he thought. And it's a dream. There was no actual ladder or staircase in that particular spot. He didn't happen to stumble upon a special geographical location where that's where the angels have to come and go. No, we know God is everywhere, and his angels are free to move about very easily. And anyways, the, God was revealing to Jacob, his presence, and the promises on his life. And significantly, this was the first time that Jacob had had direct connection with God. See, before this, he was just relying, he, his faith was in the words that had been passed on to him from his parents. But now, God had come to speak with him directly. And I know that sometimes we wish God would do that with us. You know, how it would be so awesome and so reassuring if God would just come and just speak to me verbally or something. Not through the Bible, God. Just give me some. But, you know, there was a guy named Thomas, one of Jesus' disciples. And after Jesus' resurrection, Thomas said, I'm, I do not believe in the resurrection until I see his hands and his side and can touch his wounds. Now, Jesus, being the really nice guy that he is, humored Thomas's doubt and did appear to him and allow him to touch those wounds. But he also said in John 20, 29, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. See, Thomas doubted and Jacob did as well. And his doubt led him to resort to lying and which now had him traveling far away from his family. And he's about to get into the strangest honeymoon and engagement process that there's ever been. But with both of these doubters, God was gracious. And it would have been understandable with, with, with Jacob and with Thomas if they had gotten a swift kick in the butt instead and been chewed out. But rather, God blessed them with the comfort of his presence. Because that's who he is. We also shouldn't read this passage that we're reading without reading John 1, 51. This is where Jesus, at, he said, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God descending and, ascending and descending on the Son of Man. 
This is important because Christ is alluding back to the story that we are reading. Right? That where Jacob, he sees that heavenly traffic and he thought that this was a spot where God and his angels come to earth. But that wasn't the case. God is everywhere. And like I said, his angels can come and go. Now, of course, it, there came a time when the most holy place in the temple was a very special dwelling place for the Lord's presence. But Jesus came along and, and he changed everything. When he died, the veil in the temple was torn. And, and about this verse in John 1.51, Victor Hamilton said, All those scholars have suggested many different interpretations of this verse. All agree on its general meaning. Jesus is now the nexus between God and humankind. So if you want heaven, it's not a ladder or a staircase you need to find. It's not a campsite you need to stumble upon. It's not a temple you need to enter. You go through a person. He is the way. No one comes to the Father except through Christ. But old Jacob thought he stumbled upon a special place and found God. It's understandable, but I think he was a little dull. All right? Like he thought there was something special about this place, and he didn't realize it wasn't about the place. It was about him. God is with you, Jacob, not your campsite. He thought he had found God, but God found him. And thankfully, we worship a God who seeks us. Now, I'm going to bring that back up in a second, but we see this Luke 19, 10, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And John 4, 23, but the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. We worship a God who seeks us. Now, there's other scriptures about how we also seek the Lord, but we have to understand that doesn't, that's not teaching that we actually have to find him like he's hiding. He is already there. We're the ones hiding. All right? So the movement that needs to happen is not a movement of our legs, but a movement of our hearts. As Jeremiah made so clear, and you will, well, God, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me. With all your heart. You see, the work has been done. God is not distant. Acts 17, 26 to 27. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation, that they would seek God, if perhaps they may feel around for him and find him. Though he is not far from each one of us. This is why our salvation is not based on the works that we do. God has done all the work. We just have to open our hearts. He is there. We just have to open our eyes. Let's finish this chapter. Early in the morning, Jacob took the stone that was near his head and set it up as a marker. He poured oil on top of it and named the place Bethel. Though previously the city was named Luz. Then Jacob made a vow. If God will be with me and watch over me during this journey I'm making, if he provides me with food to eat and clothing to wear, and if I return safely to my father's family, then the Lord will be my God. This stone that I have set up as a marker will be God's house, and I will give you to you a tenth of all that you give me. Jacob's vow could be interpreted in different ways. So one way of looking at it is that he is bargaining with God. He's saying, God, if you do this for me, then I'll do this for you. Which, that makes sense based on Jacob's character so far. But, some people think, well, no, it's, he's not bargaining with God. He's actually putting his faith in God. You know, he, he's saying, like, God, you're saying that you're going to do this. I believe that you're going to do this. And you are going to be my God because of your promises that you've given me. And I hope that's true. You know, I don't know Jacob's heart. If, if it was a heart of faith, that is wonderful. But I wanted to at least entertain the idea that he was bargaining with God. 
or at least inter, at least address the idea of bargaining with God anyway, because it is a problem and it's something that's easy to fall into. And it can be tempting to bargain with God. If you do this, I'll do this, God. But that mentality is disrespectful from, to who God is and puts God in a position of having to work for us. Right? Like, hey, God, you need to earn my worship, you know? Hey, God, you, you, you need to buy my allegiance here. Well, God needs nothing of the sort. We act like he needs us. It's not true. He does not need you. But he wants you. But we, sometimes we are like, well, God, you know, man, I know that you could really, you could really use my worship here. Or, God, I know that my expertise would be real valuable for you. Or, God, I know, you know, it would be really good for you if, if I went to church every Sunday or, or if I was giving an offering. And, and, you know, God, I need something too. But there's another way that we bargain with God, all right, where we feel like we are buying His help. So one way is more about Him getting something from us, and another way is more about us getting something from him. And that happened to a man named Jephthah in the book of Judges. Jephthah was leading an army out to battle against the Ammonites. And Jephthah told God that if, if he would give them victory in the battle, that he would sacrifice the first thing that came out of his house to meet him when he returned. Well, they went to battle and they won. And he came home and his only child... His daughter ran out to meet him. That was stupid. That was a foolish vow that didn't serve anyone well. Because bargaining with God cheapens his power and his grace. You see, we cheapen his power when we act like he needs something from us and he could buy it. And we cheapen his grace when we act like we need something from him and we can buy it. First of all, he needs nothing from us. He desires our love and our worship. Not because he needs it, but because that is what is best. And second, we need everything from him. But he gives by grace, not merit. I've seen people who only attend church whenever life gets rough. Life starts to get difficult, and they'll go back to church, and then as soon as life smooths out again, they'll disappear. They think they've done something. They think maybe they've earned something. They don't realize, they don't even know God, and Satan is perfectly capable and very happy to smooth some things out in your life as long as it'll keep you in that cycle and away from true worship. And others have a hard time wrapping their head around the idea that God's grace and his favor and his salvation are free. At least to us. Like Jephthah, they'll make short-sighted, foolish vows that end up hurting themselves and others for no reason. They're trying to accomplish for themselves what Christ already finished on the cross. He did it. And so as we finish this morning, I'll ask you this, I'll ask you a few questions. The first one is, do you like God's plans? <laughs> you might like the ending, but do you like, have you read what it's going to take to get there? It's not going to be easy. And it's okay sometimes to not like how things are going, but trust God Anyway, don't harden your heart like Esau did. Don't shake your fist and curse God. Fall on your face and pray. Maybe you need some more work on aligning your desires with God's. Well, not maybe. We're all working on that. And we do it by delighting ourselves in the Lord. Drawing near to Him. That's the only way. There's no shortcut with that. There's no magic prayer to pray, book to read, or retreat to attend. It is a relationship-building process. And what about your worldview? Do you even have a biblical worldview? 
I intend to find out, which I'll talk about a little bit at the end. I hope you do, but many Christians think more like unbelievers than they realize. And that will not serve you well. But the good news is, it's not actually that hard to change, as long as you're willing. If you're willing to humble yourself and believe what God says, even if you don't like it, all you really have to do is humble yourself and get to know God's Word. And you do that, you continue to come, and you listen, and you hear the Word of God being taught, and you get together in small groups with other believers, and you study it together, and you study it by yourself at home, and you pray, and you just let God transform your mind. He doesn't make it hard to know Him. He seeks us. And finally, are you guilty of bargaining with God? It's okay to petition God. It's good. You should do that. But when you make your request, remember His power and His grace. Because you're not going to make Him an offer He can't refuse. You know? And this is the last thing I'll say. He doesn't need anything. And he doesn't charge anything. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. God, thank you for bringing us together this morning. You are so, so, so good. And uh, I am so thankful. I don't know what life would be like without you. I, I, I can't even fathom what it would be like. And it should break our hearts to see a world that's full of that exact reality. Of people without you. So as we sit and, and just be and, and are thankful for what you've done for us, that you've given us a solid rock to stand on, that you've given us promises that are sure. Lord, help us not to take it for granted. Help us to not get hardened and calloused to the reality that there are so many who don't have that. And the pain that that must cause. And the confusion. So God, we pray that we would have a heart to go and help and speak and live all in ways that will bring more people to the truth if, if, if it's possible. Lord, if, if they're willing, we pray that they would be we pray that you would help us to find people who are willing to know you and be known by you. God, help us to trust you no matter what things look like. Help us not to fall into the trap of hardening our hearts. Help us not to try to bargain with you and, and, and disrespect your power and your grace. And God, if there's anyone here that doesn't have salvation, I pray that they would not leave without it. All it takes is believing in who you are and who Christ is and what he has done on the cross for our sins, but then repenting, choosing to turn away and walk towards you, away from our sins and towards you, letting you be the Lord and the master of our life. And then for the rest of us who may be, who do know you, Lord, that doesn't automatically mean that we have a biblical worldview. So we pray that you would help us to get there if we don't. And if we do, that we would help others get there who don't. And 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.